Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to shift uh, to asking each of you, what, what do you see right now at, as the greatest impediments to the continued development and expansion of our commercial crew and commercial cargo capacity? I would say that the, um, having the market develop is important. Commercial industries follow the market. So continuing the, um, con extending ISS, continuing the research on ISS, uh, which by itself is a great thing, independent of, of commercial crew, provides that kind of a, a foundation and a starting point going forward. Um, it's important that we um, maintain the industry in such a way that it's safe and reliable and don't let um, public opinion erode because we have accidents that could have been avoided, for example. So we need to keep it as a robust industry moving forward. Things like the um, the CSLA re legislation that help with the um, cost of insurance for launches are important that we maintain uh, that going forward. We need to develop working relationships with regulatory agencies like the FAA, similar to the way we do that in commercial airplanes. It's a really good partnership today, and keeping that going, I think, is important. Um, so those are the kind of things to stimulate the, um, the growth of the commercial sector, I believe. Dr. Pace? Sir. Um Two things, market demand and a predictable environment for investment. Uh, right now that demand is predominantly driven by government to the extent that we can uh, see non-government demand uh, come for a lot of these activities, uh, things beyond the space station, uh, then it will be more sustainable. Uh, but that begs the question of what comes really after the space station, although we're talking about extending to 2025. In aerospace terms, that's just right around the corner. And uh, I think one of the things that I uh, worry about, which contributes both to the fragility of our political relations with other countries, as well as the fragility in the uh, commercial uh, industry, is if you're not planning today as to what you're going to be doing next, what you're really doing is planning to go out of business. And so we need to have, I think, a, a very thoughtful discussions and decisions very soon as to what not only ISS extension, but also post-ISS, what does that look like, whether in LEO or beyond? Uh, because without that, there won't really be that investment environment, nor will there be the international partner environment. Uh, so that uncertainty, I think, is the greatest thing we could address. And, and Mr. Stalmer, you mentioned in your testimony also some suggested reforms in reauthorization of the Commercial Space Launch Act. I, I would welcome your el elaborating a bit on those reforms. Certainly. Um, thank you, Senator. I think regulator regulatory uncertainty is a, a major barrier that the, the launch industry could face. Um, with indemnification, is critical for our, our global competitiveness. Uh, right now, China, France, um, uh, Japan all indemnify far more than, than the U.S. So that, that's critical right now. Extending the learning period. The learning period currently uh, w was eight years. If we want to foster this, this um, economy, this, this space, uh, the economy that we have right now in the, the launch industry, we really need to extend that and continue to work together uh, as partners right now uh, with the FAA uh, because nothing is more paramount to the commercial companies than safety, to developing a safe product. It, if you don't have a safe product, you're not going to have a commercial product, um, a commercial uh, business to that extent. So the regulatory uncertainty uh, is critical, but also the funding, uh, knowing for, for commercial crew, um, like yourself, I find it completely unacceptable that we have to depend on the Russians to launch U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station. So any sort of disruption um, in the commercial crew program, I think, would be a tremendous setback. Uh, I know how much it pained the NASA administrator to have to extend those, those flights onto 2018 um, for contingency purposes. But I think if we uh, continue with the, the, the budgetary, uh, the prudent budgetary measures through these um, through the commercial crew program, I think uh, that is one of, the, one of the best ways we can move forward, and especially with the Commercial Space Launch Act. You mentioned concerns about safety, and, and, and obviously there is an element of risk that, that is inherent in space exploration. The, the safest option would be never to go into space. And, and, and so what is the right way for regulation to balance those safety concerns 
with the desire to continue expanding our capability and, and exploring new frontiers? You have to test and learn. You have to test and learn. And, and as we found that out the hard way this past October with an experimental test flight. But as Americans, I think we're going to continue to push the envelope. This is what we want to do. And we've mentioned our, our westward expansion goals and just the, the manifest destiny of the United States. Uh, safety will always be an issue. Uh, as my, my colleague, uh, my predecessor, had once told me, you know, went down to the, uh, the Orion launch. Because the thing you, you have to remember that 10,000 things can go wrong and only one thing can go right. And that's something you always have to keep in mind. But it's the, it's the redundancy of safety, of testing, evaluating, learning from, from the, uh, the testing that you're doing and the data that you collect to move forward. And I think the, uh, the commercial space flight industry is doing that in spades. Let me ask the, the panel a, a, a different question. What is the shortest time frame we can reasonably no longer be dependent on the Russian Soyuz and also the RD-180? And, and what would be required to accelerate that time frame to the soonest date possible? So, so I'll address that from the perspective of um, launching commercial crew. The, um, we're on a path with uh, CST-100 to be able to launch crew in 2017. That, that path is paced now by the internal work that we're doing uh, with our suppliers, uh, with our integration and test, going through the certification process that will allow us to certify that vehicle based on the lessons that we've learned on shuttle and station so that it's, it's certified and, and ready to fly. Um, our program at the moment is not being paced by dollars, um, so if the question was hinting at could we apply more money to go faster, uh, at this point we need to apply the level of funding that um, we proposed in our contract and, and we'll be able to achieve that on, on the pace we're on. Um, relative to the RD-180, there's been a lot of discussion about the RD-180 today. Uh, I would say this, um, the Atlas V is an incredibly dependable launch vehicle as a system. It, um, has had 53 successful launches, and in fact, that's the reason we selected it as our launch vehicle um, to get going. It would seem that over time it would make sense um, to work to transition away from dependence on the Russians. I would hope that we don't do that in, an abrupt, in a very abrupt way that would cause us to um, impact our national security as a country um, and also our commercial launch industry. Um, so I'm hopeful that, that that is a thoughtful process and that we work through that in a, in a way that um, addresses the geopolitical concerns that are out there, um, but also the technical concerns of, of being able to keep up launching that vehicle. So, so how would you define a, a, a thoughtful process? Because there, there is always the risk geopolitically right. that particularly if things escalate with Mr. Putin, that he decides to use access to space as a weapon. And, and were he to cut off access to either the Soyuz or the RD-180, that would impose significant hardships on the United States. So, so how would you propose we, we deal with that potential threat? Well, certainly we have an inventory of existing engines that are available to use, and there are more engines on order that are coming. And so, you know, keeping that pipeline open as long as is reasonable is good. Um, I'm, I don't have insight into exactly where it's going, but ULA has announced that they're working with another company, perhaps for or maybe other companies, for a replacement engine for the RD-180. And so, you know, working through that in a way that, that doesn't just um, declare, okay, that's enough, no more, um, but using the assets that we have and keeping those assets and that pipeline open as long as we can mm -hmm. to facilitate a transition. Dr. Pace, Mr. Stallmark, do you have thoughts on these questions? I think the question depends on when you think the immediate risks are. If you thought there is a risk uh, tomorrow uh, or even today, then the answer is, you know, we have the inventory, you know, we have. Beyond that inventory, if uh, your next bet is you have a very expensive option but a very doable option which is manifesting on the delta. Uh, looking beyond that, the answer ultimately, of course, is to have a U.S. source. And uh, the proposals, I think, that have been put forward uh, for uh, building a replacement engine, uh, LOX kerosene, LOX methane uh, engine, uh, the numbers that I've heard uh, have been on the order of like three or four years. 
uh, that it would take to do that. Perhaps that could be accelerated a little bit on money, but I think there probably are some parts that you can't accelerate, and you're talking three to four years. So if you think that the uh, crisis with Russia is not going to go away, uh, and is going to be with us for uh, some time to come, then the answer, in my view, is to begin development of that engine uh, and to do so now. If it turns out that everything works out great or we have uh, uh, other options come up, that's fine. But if we don't have that option, uh, then we will find our negotiating leverage much reduced. Senator, I would, I would add that, uh, as Mr. Alban was saying, one of our companies, a company called Blue Origin, founded by uh, uh, Mr. Bezos, um, they're working right now on developing a new engine, I think, to help uh, re uh, alleviate the RD-180 problem, the BE-4 engine. Um, I've been to that facility uh, in, in Seattle. It is tremendously impressive what they're doing out there, um, as well as uh, traveling to the, the SpaceX facility and what SpaceX is doing with their uh, engine technology and as well as with the commercial crew vehicle. I think they would like to be online and get us off our uh, Russian dependence as soon as possible. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate I think that date is, is known sooner than 2017. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate uh, the testimony you've given. I appreciate your being here today. This was, I think, a very productive hearing. Um, I would note for each of you the question of Regulatory uncertainty was a question I believe all three of you raised. Uh, that is a, a significant concern of mine. Uh, and in moving forward with reauthor authorization of the Commercial Launch Act, uh, regulatory reform is, is, is going to be a component that, 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 that we're going to look at. And so I would welcome from each of the witnesses your specific ideas on reforms that would provide greater certainty, accelerate the development of either commercial crew or commercial launch, com commercial cargo, uh, and, and, and expand uh, the, the, the commercial capacities we have. Uh, I will also note that the hearing record will remain open for two weeks. Uh, during that time, senators are asked to submit any questions for the record. Uh, and upon receipt, the, the witnesses are, are requested to submit th their written answers to the committee as soon as possible. Uh, and with that, I want to thank each of you for being here. I want to thank uh, our witnesses on the first panel. And the hearing is concluded. Thank you.